We begin our study on the subject of Gene Dixon, Edgar Cayce, and reincarnation with a biblical observation, which I think is tremendously important. It is the observation that it is given to all men first to die, and after this, the judgment. And the admonition from the scripture that if there arise a prophet among you or a dreamer of dreams, Deuteronomy chapter 13, if you care to look at it in your Bibles, and gives you a sign or a wonder. And then this particular prophet or dreamer of dreams uses that particular gift as a means of attempting to draw you away from the Lord your God. Then you recognize immediately that this is not of God, that it is not inspired by the Holy Spirit, and that you are to set yourself against it. In fact, in the theocratic kingdom, which Moses presided over as prophet under the guidance of God in the Old Testament, we have very definite counsel given concerning those who are false prophets. They were to be executed if they did these things. Now, we don't do that today, but this is how strongly the Lord felt on the subject of the perversion of the Word of God and of false prophets. Now, as we go into the subject of Gene Dixon and Edgar Cayce and reincarnation, it is imperative that we understand that we are not criticizing Mrs. Dixon as a person or the memory of Edgar Cayce since he is deceased. We are criticizing the content of what they say and we are putting it side by side with what the Bible has to say on the thesis that we are to test everything and hold fast to that which is good. The scripture tells us that we are to test the spirits to see whether they are from God because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Now 1 John 4 is urging us to make this test and we're going to follow that counsel. Now let's focus for just a moment upon the phenomena of Jean Dixon. She burst upon the scene a few short years ago with all kinds of prophecies and predictions and gained national and international fame by a prediction that she made concerning the late President John F. Kennedy. Namely, that he would be assassinated. Now, it is true, and Mrs. Dixon did write, that she saw a shadow over the White House and that the president who would be elected at this particular time in this election was marked for assassination or she felt could be assassinated. Uh, she was on fairly safe statistical ground if you go back in history uh, because you notice that other presidents in the same time periods also underwent assassination. James Garfield underwent assassination. Abraham Lincoln underwent assassination. If you start adding up the periods of time, you come to John F. Kennedy. Lincoln was assassinated a hundred years before Kennedy's administration. It's very interesting to note also, as Mrs. Dixon has pointed out, that Lincoln was assassinated and had a private secretary named Kennedy. Kennedy was assassinated and had a private secretary named Lincoln. This has been pointed out by a number of people involved in the occult. Therefore, not only Mrs. Dixon, but others have suggested that there was an assassination attempt due in American history on the presidency. Mrs. Dixon focused it on the Kennedy administration because she claimed that this had been revealed to her. She maintained this by use of a crystal ball and also by receiving information, she says, comes from God. She professes to be a devout Roman Catholic and she professes to have the gift of prophecy, according to a book written uh, by Ruth Montgomery, which represents Mrs. Dixon as a seer. Now, the one thing which characterizes biblical prophets is that they are consistent in their revelations. Biblical prophets are not known for making mistakes. They are known for being accurate always in what they say. If it could be shown that Mrs. Dixon's prophecies are inaccurate and that if a good number of them are inaccurate, then I think it is safe to assume that we are not dealing with a biblical prophet. And if we're not dealing with a biblical prophet, just what kind of prophet or prophetess are we dealing with? So in order to document this, let's go to the writings of Mrs. Dixon herself. 
what she has said in her syndicated column, which appears in uh, more than 200 newspapers in the United States, what she has spoken of on national radio and television panels, what her views are and what she maintains, to see whether or not she is really in the category of biblical prophecy, or if she maintains the gift of prophecy, which is mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter uh, 12 and chapter 14. Is she really within this particular perimeter? Let me draw your attention to some of Mrs. Dixon's prophecies. On January 27th, 1968, Mrs. Dixon predicted that Lyndon Johnson would be the nominee for the presidency that year. Uh, he did not receive the nomination that year. Instead, the nomination for the presidency of the United States went to Hubert Humphrey. Mrs. Dixon also predicted, in exactly the same column, that Jacqueline Kennedy, and I quote her now, is not now thinking of marriage. She will marry only when time dims the memory of her late husband's assassination and the death of infant Patrick Bouvier Kennedy. Only at the end of 1968 may she seriously consider marriage. On October 19, 1968, the day before the wedding of Jacqueline Kennedy and Aristotle Onassis, Mrs. Dixon made the prediction that this wedding would not take place. Now, it seems apparent to anybody who is really studying carefully what Mrs. Dixon is saying, that when she makes these predictions, she is making them based upon information she claims to receive from supernatural sources. If this is so, then a little column which was inserted next to hers on January 27th, 1968, entitled Bad Day for a Seer, which read this way, quote, her negative vibrations regarding marriage centered on Lord Harlech, close quote. Please delete references in prediction to Mrs. Kennedy, close quote. In other words, what was being said was this. Mrs. Dixon says that there is going to be a fulfillment of prophecy relative to Jacqueline Kennedy. However, there are negative vibrations which are now being received. So it's a bad day for the seer or for the prophet Therefore, please delete any references to this that appear in the column, even though they have been recorded as valid. And it was a good idea that they were deleted because she was marrying Aristotle Onassis, which did confuse the issue considerably. Now, when you run into this problem where a prophet has to be corrected in type in the column, when the prophecy is already in transit to the public, then you know that you have more than a minor problem with the prophet or the prophetess. And Mrs. Dixon goes on to make a number of other predictions which are worthwhile thinking about. The New York Daily News, January 1st, 1953, she predicted that Dwight Eisenhower would appoint General Douglas MacArthur, quote, to a very important post in his administration, probably to the post of an ambassadorship, close quote. Instead, General MacArthur became the leader of the Remington Rand Corporation, chairman of the board, and maintained his position independent of all politics until his death. He was never offered nor accepted any ambassadorship. Mrs. Dixon went on to say that World War III, and I'm quoting her, would break out in 1958. Fortunately for the world, that did not occur. She also said that one of Russia's allies will, quote, turn against her after the Soviet armies have pushed through Iran and into Palestine, close quote. She then said, Russia will move into Iran in the fall of 1953. The bear will not move on to Palestine until 1957, close quote. Well, the bear hasn't moved into Palestine, which is now Israel, since then. And it's very significant that if Mrs. Dixon is indeed a prophetess, that she did not foresee the restoration of Israel in 1948, nor the cataclysmic Six-Day War in 1967. 
both of these events totally eluded her crystal ball. Now, in some of our other utterances, Mrs. Dixon has gone further and said that she receives some help from a talking snake that appears from time to time at the foot of her bed. I think that it would be a good idea to just look at that for a second. This is a vision which began on July 14, 1952, at about midnight. She was not really asleep, but just dozing off, apparently. And uh, the body of a snake, about the thickness, allegedly, of a garden hose, appeared to be on the bed. And I'm quoting now. Uh, its body slid down the side of the bed, and at the bottom by the feet it raised up the corner of the mattress. Its head nudged her ankles and gradually wrapped itself around her legs and hips, making its way slowly up the body. It entwined itself about her chest, and she finally saw its head. The snake gazed towards the east several times, as much as to say to her that one must look to the east for God's guidance. For some strange reason, this snake also brought with it a feeling for love, goodness, and peace. This, the snake gradually withdrew, sliding down the left side of the bed toward the east, and vanished. This is a quotation of the event, which is reproduced in the book, uh, uh, 20th Century Prophecy and uh, recounts what Mrs. Dixon saw. Now, I have always been suspicious of uh, prophetic snakes. <laughs> Ever since I read the early chapters of the book of Genesis. <laughs> and I'm more suspicious now because that vision led Mrs. Dixon to this prophecy. Shortly before 7 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, February 5th, 1962, a child was born of humble parent origin in the Middle East who will one day be the future world leader. The great force of this man will be felt and understood in the early 1980s. His power would continue to grow until 1999 when we would have a world without war, a time of peace on earth to all men of goodwill. Close quote. Now, this is tremendously interesting because in today's Gene Dixon column, if you look at it, you will notice that Mrs. Dixon has identified this great world leader with the Antichrist mentioned in the Bible. And she has predicted the second advent of Jesus Christ to occur in the year 2080. Of course, there won't be anybody now living there to verify her prediction. If the Lord should come in between, we won't have to worry about that. We will have empirical verification. If you're a post-tribulationist and the Antichrist materializes before then, you'll have all the empirical verification that you need. But you will not have any problem whatever with the subject under discussion, simply because Mrs. Dixon has covered her prophetic interpretation with the mantle of time, namely... Nobody's going to be around to really check it out. And if they do, when you're dead, you can't be too embarrassed. Mrs. Dixon won't be around at that particular juncture, and therefore she won't be too embarrassed by the fact that the Bible has said, and it will be quoted then if earth is still functioning and Christ has not returned, that it is impossible to predict the coming of Jesus Christ, for our Lord has told us that no man knows the day or the hour. And these things the Father has placed in his own power. So when we are dealing with Mrs. Dixon and these prophecies, let's understand how they came about and what the intent of the prophecy was. Now let's go a little bit further into her predictions because I think they have significance for us. October 23rd, 1954, Jane Dixon predicted that by the year 1964, China and Russia would be jointly ruled by, quote, a swarthy-skinned man who was part Oriental, close quote. I'm sure this comes as a great shock to the Soviet Union, because 1964 has come and gone, and neither Leonid Brezhnev nor Alexei Kosygin uh, fits the bill 
of a part oriental swarthy skinned man. On May 7, 1966, asked in California at Hancock Auditorium, University of Southern California, when the war in Vietnam would terminate, Mrs. Dixon said, and I quote, that the war would terminate in 90 days, but not on our terms. Well, 90 days have come and gone. This is 1972, and we are still involved in Vietnam conflict. Since we are willing to analyze these things in the light of history, independent of theology, I think we have to be fair and to say objectively that Mrs. Dixon has widely missed the mark on a number of occasions. Now, has she ever been on target? The answer is yes, she has. But being on target less than a third of the time is not really being on target so far as biblical prophecy is concerned. Biblical prophets are on target 100% of the time. Mrs. Dixon does not meet that test. Now, the scripture warns us repeatedly that we are not to put confidence in those, in anybody for that matter, who maintains to speak with the authority of God or as a Christian with a prophetic gift unless they speak in accord with Scripture. Mrs. Dixon has not done so. And true prophets always speak in accord with divine revelation. Test all revelations by the revelation the Bible has always been the basic Christian position. We must do the same with Mrs. Dixon. And no one is saying that Mrs. Dixon is not a devout individual. No one is saying that she is not a practicing Catholic of deep sincerity. No one is saying that Mrs. Dixon is not sincere in believing that she has a genuine gift. But you cannot make statements as she has made them so repeatedly through the years and have them as inaccurate as so many of them have been proven to be and still lay claim to receive a prophetic gift originating with God. There is such a thing as precognition. That is the capacity to know something in advance. This is what biblical prophets had. Precognition through the centuries. A biblical prophet who could say, Bethlehem, Though you are not the least in all the cities of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth to me, who is to rule Israel, whose going forths have been from of old, from everlasting, is a prophet who is pinpointing centuries in advance the birthplace of a Messiah. And it takes place. That is precognition par excellence. When we see this in Scripture, and we recognize that at least seven specific prophecies concerning Jesus Christ have been consummated as a result of a prophecy written more than 500 years before his birth, we know we are dealing with true precognition, with true biblical prophecy. When the prophets tell us that Christ will enter Jerusalem triumphantly, riding upon an ass and a colt, the foal of an ass, and he rides into Jerusalem that way, 600 years before the event. We are now dealing with biblical prophecy. When the scripture says that Tyre and Zidon are going to be destroyed, and that even the dust of Tyre will be scraped into the sea, and exactly the prophecy is fulfilled on schedule, as God says, we are dealing with predictive prophecy that can be pointed to with authority. We can go through the scripture and look at predictive prophecies against Hazor, against Petra, against city after city, kingdom after kingdom. And it came to pass exactly this way. This is biblical prophecy. And when Jesus Christ said, looking at the temple, that not one stone would remain upon the other, that's biblical prophecy. Because he said it some 35 years before the event. And Titus fulfilled the prophecy by destroying the temple, the complete temple, not just to its foundations, but everything. Not one stone 
resting upon another. Now, predictive biblical prophecy is accurate. It does not commit error. Mrs. Dixon is not, therefore, a biblical prophet. There are too many errors. Now, of course, the question automatically presents itself. If Mrs. Dixon is not getting her information from God, and she's not, who is she getting it from? And some people say, but if you say she's getting it from the devil, you are judging Mrs. Dixon. No, I'm not. I am saying that it's possible for Mrs. Dixon to make some very educated guesses. And I have a high percentage on educated guesses. I also know that Mrs. Dixon moves in very high circles in Washington, D.C. with an international set that gives her access to a great deal of political and economic information which she can predict about and be fairly accurate on. But what about other things, such as the Kennedy and other events that she has been on target with? What do we say to that? Well, if the information is not coming from God and he's not interested in crystal balls and horoscopes and he's not interested in talking or prophetic snakes, then what is the source? If it is precognition, knowing something in advance, then it has to have an occultic source. It has to have a source other than God and it's supernatural. I therefore maintain that Mrs. Dixon's information must come from occultic phenomena. That she is getting her information from the standard occultic procedures and crystal balls, horoscopes, dreams and visions that don't materialize sometimes fall in perfectly with manifestations of occultic phenomena well known in the study of occultism. And once we grasp the significance of that, Mrs. Dixon doesn't have to be possessed by devils to be used by them. People can be used by Satan and not be satanically possessed. I don't think Mrs. Dixon is possessed, but I am positive that Mrs. Dixon is not a biblical prophet, and I am equally positive that some of the information she got is occultic in origin. Therefore, it did not come from God. I think, therefore, that she is being used and has been used. And people will ask automatically, what's the reason for it? Why is Satan doing this? Very easy to answer that. Today, everywhere, we have an explosion of occultic phenomena. When you talk to people about psychic phenomena and you talk to people about occultism and you talk about a real world of other dimensional properties, People no longer look at you as if you're crazy because parapsychology and some very respectable investigators have established the fact that there is reality in another dimension. Now, what Satan is doing, and quite successfully, is to try and equate all phenomena with that dimension to make it all seem as if it is godly, to make it all seem as if it is good, so that you can penetrate the realm believing that you are going to receive something from God. The spiritists tell you that they are representing God. The Rosicrucians tell you that they are representing cosmic consciousness. If you study all of the cultic and occultic structures of our day, they are all in harmony with the divine mind, they tell us. Nobody is going to claim that the devil is giving them the help and the assistance in this dimension of reality, in this psychic dimension. Except, of course, the Church of Satan and others who are actively worshipping the devil, no holds barred. They'll make the claim, but they're relatively small in numbers. Everybody is claiming that this dimension of phenomena is a good dimension. Therefore, if you can have somebody going around wearing a cross and appearing on television programs and radio programs and writing prophecies and predictions and claiming to be a Christian and to represent Christianity 
and telling you that certain things are going to happen and once in a while it happens, you are going to think that there is such a thing as a valid 20th century prophet in the context of biblical revelation. And that's precisely what you haven't got. You don't have a valid prophet in the context of biblical revelation. You have instead a very mixed up prophetess who is not getting any information from God. And one of the great masterpieces of the devil is to convince the world that all psychic phenomena is essentially good for you. Dr. Oz Guinness once put it this way, people today are buying the philosophy that if it's real, it's right. Nothing could be further from the truth. Something can be very real and lethally wrong, destructive to the soul, by getting you to put your faith in something that is not truly spiritual, but only imitates the spiritual. This is precisely what we're up against in the prophecies of Jean Dixon. She is a 20th century prophetess, but she speaks not according to the law and the testimony. And finally, one other remark. All of the prophets of the Bible shared one thing in common. All of them testified to Jesus Christ. To him give all the prophets witness that whoever believes in him shall receive the forgiveness of sins. What is Mrs. Dixon's theology of evangelism? Does she really witness for Jesus Christ as a prophetess? Is Mrs. Dixon using the gift of prophecy to tell people that they must come into the kingdom of God? Does she really believe that one must become a Christian in order to be saved? And the answer I can give you categorically is that Mrs. Dixon does not believe that. She believes that it is possible to be saved outside of the Christian gospel. And because of that, and this is significant, we are not dealing with a Christian theological structure of salvation. John 14, 6 says, quoting the Lord Jesus Christ, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. If you press Mrs. Dixon as she has been pressed on television and radio programs, you will find that Mrs. Dixon is willing to accept people from all cross sections of theological structures and world religions. She'll accept them. If they're living up to the best light they can, if they're living good lives, if they're trying and if they're sincere, there is no attempt to utilize the gift of prophecy to bring these people to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. None whatever. And that is the true test of a prophet. The New Testament prophets testified to the Lord Jesus and desired that people come to him. The Old Testament prophets looked forward to him and testified that without him there was no salvation. He was the coming redeemer, the fulfillment of all that God had for man. This is not found in Mrs. Dixon's theology. Therefore, it is not necessary to go to the horoscope charts. It's not necessary to go to the crystal ball it's not necessary to go to the dreams and visions and prophetic snakes. One need only go to the Word of God to find that which is essential for the salvation of the soul today. Repentance toward God, faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. For if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. That is the Christian message. One would delight to hear Mrs. Dixon, as a prophetess of God, stand fearlessly on radio and television and in print and say that the gift of prophecy she has comes directly from Jesus Christ, God's Son, Savior of the world, without whom there is no redemption, and that her main task is not parlor parties and crystal balls and horoscopes, but her main task is to be a witness for her Savior. Then... We could listen to Mrs. Dixon 
because then her prophetic image would improve immediately. And if she did have the gift of prophecy, then it would become instantaneously accurate all the time. God has a long record of never making mistakes. Now, it's impossible to talk about Gene Dixon and prophecy without moving to Edgar Cayce, who is another of the 20th century prophets. Edgar Cayce was a Presbyterian Sunday school teacher, lived in Virginia Beach, spent his time giving readings when he was in the state of unconsciousness. He is therefore known as the sleeping prophet. What did Edgar Cayce do? He gave readings to individuals about their physical condition and emotional condition, and then he overlapped into the area of theology. What is the principal emphasis of Edgar Cayce's readings? Healing. And he did predict some remarkable things. Edgar Cayce predicted healings that he could not ever have known about as a normal human being. He had no medical training. Yet, he diagnosed illnesses when in the state of trance and prescribed medicines for them and cures which worked. And there is clinical and empirical verification for the fact that Casey and the ARE, the Association for Research and Enlightenment, has documented this, that Casey truly performed what he said under trance, that he actually was able to help people. No one is criticizing Edgar Casey for helping people. No one is criticizing the cures of Edgar Casey, and there were thousands of them. What we're really going to ask ourselves is this. What was the theology of Edgar Casey? And what was the goal or the motivation for his cures? When he was asleep and giving these cures, he also, under questioning, answered theological areas of inquiry. And we want to know what his theology was. A miracle in itself, as we discovered in our previous study of healing the divine and the devilish, means nothing. Satan has the power to heal and quite frequently exercises it. What does a miracle mean? Nothing in itself. It's who works the miracle. And for what purpose is it performed? That will answer our question. If a miracle is performed in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, God is given the glory, and the person becomes a disciple of Christ and gets into the work of God and goes out to proclaim the gospel, we're dealing with that, which is of God. But if somebody is healed in a cultic or an occultic system by a miracle, and then the person becomes involved more deeply day by day in the occultic system, doesn't become a witness for Christ, doesn't evangelize, does nothing, except promote that system, whether it's Christian science, or unity, or spiritism, or the Association for Research and Enlightenment. Can it truly be said that we are dealing with a biblical miracle? I believe the answer is categorically no, we're not. We're dealing with the power of Satan, and it's used to draw people away from the gospel of Christ. Miracles are for the purpose of testifying to the glory of God and to bring people face to face with the reality of the risen Christ. Satan is interested in using miracles for the purpose of enslaving people within occultic and cultic structures. And the people who are healed within these structures become devotees of the system. The other night we had a young girl 21 years in Christian Science, who told me after the meeting, when she came up to the platform, that she was just a type of wishy-washy Christian scientist until she experienced her first healing. She was in the hospital with acute appendicitis and they had to operate on her, and she was in terrible pain, and she suddenly started to apply Mrs. Eddy's thinking and she said the pain disappeared and the swelling disappeared and she was healed. And she said, you let me out of here. I'm a Christian scientist. I don't want to be operated on. And she got out of that hospital and she had no more appendicitis and she's never had it since. And they couldn't understand what happened to her. 
Anybody that understands the Bible can understand what has happened to her. Namely, she became immediately after that one of the most gung-ho, right-on Christian scientists you could ever meet. Why? Because the system worked. And she bought it. She said, after that, I was all out for Christian science. Well, quite obviously then, in Edgar Casey's system, as in all systems like this, if it works for you, you buy it. This is exactly part of the satanic plan. I know a lot of people don't like the usage of the term satanic. They don't like classification of the devil in this area. But I would urge you to seriously think about this. Because if Jesus Christ is doing the healing in all these cultic systems, then the Christian house is divided against itself. Because we are preaching Jesus Christ crucified, risen, and coming again, which is classic Christian theology. The cultic and the occultic are not. No amount of logic on earth is going to reconcile the two positions. If there are healings in both of them, and Christ is responsible for both, then he is blessing both the preaching and the non-preaching of his gospel equally. And his own words come back to haunt him, not us. A kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. Therefore, what we see in the cultic and the occultic is not of God. What we see in the church must be. Therefore, in the words of the Christian century, who a few years ago ran a series of articles on the cults, and they ran it in such a sympathetic position and viewpoint, that people were writing into the Christian century asking them where they could write to the cult so that they could join them because it was such a sympathetic presentation. So in the words of the Christian century, they wrote an editorial and they said, we appreciate the presentation of the material on the cults, but let it never be forgotten. We are the church. They are the cults. Let's never forget we are the church, and God has entrusted to us this ministry of reconciliation. So when we get to Edgar Casey, his healings are acknowledged, but they must be interpreted in the light of his theology. That's a fair evaluation. What is his theology? What did Casey really believe? And what of reincarnation? Because that's at the core of Casey's thinking. But what did Edgar Cayce think of the Lord Jesus Christ and of the doctrine of the Trinity? Let's look at it for just a moment because it's meaningful. How many brought your Bibles today? Good. We're going to be using them in just a moment. What is the Godhead question to Cayce when he was asleep? The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. There is an outpouring of the Spirit on thee as you pour it out upon thy fellow man. For as you do it unto the least of thy brethren, you do it unto thy Maker. For until you have seen it in the purpose of each soul, though in error he may be, that you would worship in thy Maker, you have not begun to think straight. For God is one Lord, one law that abides aright in the hearts of those who seek to do and to know his biddings. Then as thy body, thy mind, and thy soul are but the three-dimensional phases of the concept of the Godhead, use each as such. Now just listen to that for a second. Thy body, thy mind, and thy soul are but the three-dimensional phases of the concept of the Godhead, use each as such. For as you perceive you are in a three-dimensional consciousness of the earth, Yet in Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, Uranus, you may be in the four, five, seven, or eight. These are a part, then, of the eternal turmoil, as one perceives in the three-dimensional consciousness. They manifest in the three-dimensional Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are one, even as thy body, thy mind, and thy soul are one. Close quote. Now, I'm sure as I read these words to you, this revelation of the doctrine of the Trinity, one thought must have crossed your mind as it crossed mine instantaneously. 
We are living in the three-dimensional plane, according to the Spirit that gave this revelation. And because of that, we have the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three. But, of course, if, the Spirit says, you are in Jupiter, Mercury, Venus, or Uranus, you're in a four, five, seven, or eight-dimensional framework. Then, of course, Trinitarian theology progresses dimensionally. So what happens? You no longer have Trinitarian theology. The Trinity changes as you move on.